So welcome everyone um, to our March is Kidney Month event. Um, Merle, how many people do we have so far? Uh, 13. Well, welcome to Lucky 13 that are online. Uh, tonight I think we're expecting 30 or 40 people to join us online. Uh, you may or may not have heard me say, so this is for our online guests, if you do have a question, we have a great volunteer in the room, Merle, who will um, relay your question to our guest speaker uh, tonight. And so we'll repeat the question and for, we have a full room of um, uh, awesome Milwaukee area people in our room here. We have like a full house actually. Um, so we're glad that those of you in the room as well as those of you online have joined us, but more importantly, I'm so glad that we're getting to work with Catherine tonight. Uh, Catherine and I met almost, almost a year ago, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, she is new to Milwaukee and has a very important job as the Medical College of Wisconsin is starting a new school of pharmacy. So we're very lucky to have um, an expert like Catherine join us tonight to talk about a really important topic that a lot of people don't realize the connection between over-the-counter pain medications and the connection to kidneys. And so um, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to our um, guest speaker tonight, Catherine. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, like Cindy said, I've been, I'm new to Milwaukee. I've only been here for about eight months now, and I just work right across the street over at the Medical College of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Um, now, we haven't matriculated our first class of students yet, but we are getting ready to, and um, we are excited to enroll our first class of students as early as this August. Um, now, previously, I was at um, Michigan. Any Michigan fans? Go Blue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that's where I completed my training as a pharmacist, um, specializing in care for, pa um, for care for patients with kidney disease. Um, now that I've made my way over and across the pond to Milwaukee, I'm very excited to continue um, working with the same, the same population and um, collaborating with the National Kidney Foundation in some of my um, future endeavors. Um, and so I really want to thank you, Cindy Hooper, as well as um, the rest of the crew with MKF here, um, as well as some folks with Freighter who have helped um, make this program happen for you guys tonight. Um, so I know Cindy kind of um, mentioned this earlier, so she kind of beat me to the punch, but um, I guess I'll be the second person to tell you guys um, happy National Kidney Month. Um, um, March, as um, all of you are aware, um, is National Kidney Month, and it's a month dedicated to raising awareness about kidney disease as well as the prevention of kidney disease. Now, um, being a pharmacist, my focus is really on the bit of prevention. So I try to make sure that the um, medications that my, um, that my patients um, practice safe medication use, that the medications that they take um, keep their kidneys healthy and um, don't do them any harm. Um, now for this presentation today, I'm really going to focus on the over-the-counter um, medications since um, these medications are widely available to everybody and many people often take these medications um, without realizing um, or they, they, tell, they take these medications without letting their um, health care providers know and they, don't, they oftentimes don't realize the um, negative effects it can have on their health, particularly their kidneys. Um, and so I'm here today to make sure that um, all of you, um, after this presentation, can practice safe medicine use and um, eventually, uh, and can keep your um, kidneys healthy. Um, so for the agenda tonight, um, I want to start off with just discussing um, why the kidneys are so important. So it'll be just uh, kidney 101, and then I want to um, and just talk about talk a little about exactly what they do in our bodies. And then I want to go into what happens when um, kidney function starts to decline, um, what causes, causes it to decline, and how kidney disease develops. And then I'll dive into some um, how some of the over-the-counter pain medicines can cause kidney disease to develop and what you can do to prevent it. And then um, at the very end, I'll touch on a little bit on um, safe medication disposal and the best ways to dispose of medications, unused medications that you have at your home. Um, and then we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Um, but please feel free to interrupt me with um, questions at any time throughout this presentation. Um, I 
like to make this a little bit more interactive. So um, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to raise your hand or just um, shout out any questions you have. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Um, what are the kidneys? Um, the kidneys, like the heart and lungs, are important organs. Um, they are shaped like a bean. Um, the bean is actually named after the organ and not the other way around. Um, and normally you have two kidneys, and each is about the size of your fist. Um, and they're located in your um, lower back, um, right below your rib cage. And you can actually locate your kidneys if you put your hands on your hips and just um, slide them up until you can feel your rib cage. Um, and um, if you hold your hands there, um, if you put your thumbs on your back, that's actually where your kidneys are, right below your thumbs. You can't feel it, but they are there. Um, now the kidneys have many important roles. Um, one, of the, um, one of the roles that most people are familiar with is that it moves waste products from the body. Um, now um, your body is, um, you can think of your body like a giant sack of chemical reactions. You have, um, chem these chemical reactions occur 24 hours a day and they, um, they're breaking down the foods you eat into small, um, small um, substances that your cells can use for, to create energy. Um, and it'll help, uh, helps keep you alive. Um, but your cells can't take in everything um, that is created um, or use everything. So anything that is um, extra or not, is not usable by, by the cells um, needs to be excreted as waste. Otherwise, it'll um, accumulate in the body um, and, it'll, um, and um, it'll be toxic to, um, to the person. Um, now, um, your kidneys are able to tell exactly what is waste or not, and so what is one of its functions. So um, it, it's able to just, uh, tell um, what is needed by the body and what is um, not needed, what is, what is waste. And so anything that's waste, um, the kidney will remove from the body. Um, now the kidneys also remove excess fluid from the body, so they help with the balance of um, how much water is in your body. Um, everybody needs to drink water to stay alive. Um, we all consume water on a daily basis, um, but your bodies can only hold so much water. Um, and so your kidneys help balance, um, help with this balance. Um, if you ever get dehydrated, um, the kidneys will also help in this as well. Um, and you may notice um, these effects. If you if you go a day um, and you, where you don't drink enough water, um, you'll, you'll be dehydrated and you won't be producing as much urine. Um, and this is your kidney's way, as, uh, kidney's way of holding in, um, retaining some of the water so um, you don't become, um, so it maintains that proper um, balance so you're, you're able to keep the, the blood and the fluids moving in your body. Um, now one thing many people don't realize the kidneys do is that they produce a lot of different hormones. Um, hormones are chemical substances that um, act like messengers in the body. Um, they help control how cells and organs um, do their work. Um, the kidneys um, produce a hormone that is able to actually control your blood pressure. Um, if your blood pressure drops, you can, um, your kidneys can actually sense this and they, can, they produce this hormone that raises your blood pressure so it makes sure that um, all your organs um, receive the proper amount of um, blood so they're properly perfused. Um, the kidneys also produce a hormone that helps um, produce red cells in your body. Um, red, cells, red blood cells are the oxygen carrying component um, in your blood. Um, if you don't have enough red blood cells, then um, you develop what is uh, something called anemia. And when, when you become anemic, um, your body is not able, your, the tissues in your body are not able to get enough oxygen um, and you become really fatigued and so you're not um, able to function at your optimal level. Um, Another um, hormone that the kidneys produce is, um, is one that helps uh, maintain healthy bones. Um, it produces a hormone that helps activate vitamin D from the foods you eat into an active form. So when you eat vitamin D, or when you eat foods that contain vitamin D, um, it's not in its active form. The kidneys um, produce a hormone that actually activates it. So, um, and what vitamin D does, it helps um, you absorb calcium from the foods you eat. And we all know that calcium helps um, keep your bones healthy and strong. So um, without um, the kidneys um, are strong, our, we would be, our, our bones would be really weak um, and they would tend to break. Um, now how exactly do the kidneys work? Well, um, here up on the slide I have a picture of um, a kidney and we see that it has all these large vessels that branch out into these smaller vessels that yet again branch out into even these smaller vessels. Um, and um, they branch out um, until they um, 
and once you get these into these really small blood vessels, um, you can see that they eventually get intertwined with um, this yellow structure called a nephron. Um, and um, I don't know if you can see up on the screen here, um, but there are these little blood structures that, the, that connect the, um, the blood vessels to the, um, the nephrons. And this little red structure is called the glomerulus. And this is um, essentially the powerhouse of the kidney. This, is a, this acts like a filter. Um, and it filters everything that goes that's in the blood from the blood um, on into the kidney um, into the side of the nephrons. And so any waste products that is that the kidney is able to detect um, that is not needed, um, it passes through this filter um, and it makes its way um, back um, um, out this way, and it leaves the kidneys in a form of urine. Anything that cannot pass through this glomerulus or the filter, um, such as red blood cells or proteins or anything that um, too large to pass through, or just flow back um, through the um, through the um, arteries um, back into the body. So um, it'll keep a healthy balance of um, what needs to stay in the body um, to what um, needs to leave. Now each kidney has about one million of these nephrons. Um, so together with both kidneys um, in action, um, your kidneys are able to actually um, filter out your um, a total of uh, uh, 45 gallons of blood each day. So um, your blood is constantly being filtered by your kidneys. Um, and it is through the work here in the, um, the nephron or the glomerulus. Now, um, when the kidneys slowly um, uh, loses their ability to perform all of their functions, um, it is what we call um, chronic kidney disease. Um, chronic kidney disease often takes many years to progress to advanced stages. And um, once any amount of kidney function is lost, it is lost forever. Um, you cannot get it back. Um, in the United States, there is approximately 26 million American adults um, who are estimated to have um, some form of chronic kidney disease. Um, and the sad truth is that many of these pe uh, pe people don't even know that they have chronic kidney disease. Um, fortunately, there are um, a couple of ways you can find out whether you have kidney disease or not. Um, um, you can do a couple of tests. Um, one is through a urine test, which checks for um, protein in your urine. Um, normally, there should not be any protein in your urine. It's a large protein is a large molecule that cannot pass through um, the uh, filter in the kidneys. Um, but if your if, if your kidneys become damaged, um, as we see with chronic kidney disease, um, then we may see some um, some amounts of um, protein in the urine. Um, we can also do a blood test, and with this blood test, we check for a level of, um, of creatinine in blood. Um, creatinine is a waste product um, that's produced by our bodies. Um, and if, if our kidney function starts to decline, then this waste product, this creatinine, starts to build up in the body. Um, and we can use this um, creatinine as a sort of a way to measure how, much, how well our kidneys are working. Um, and um, when we, we can estimate our kidney, um, how well our kidneys are um, working, um, and we use this term called glomerul glomerular filtration rate, or um, GFR. And so this is just um, a, a way that we can um, measure how well our kidneys are working. Um, now, since uh, chronic kidney disease is a progressive disease and it takes um, a long time to develop, then we can actually use the GFR to really determine how well the kidneys are working. Um, this table here shows um, the five stages of chronic kidney disease and the GFR for each stage. Um, a normal GFR is um, 90 or above. Um, and um, if protein is present in the urine but the GFR is normal, then we um, call that, um, or we consider that to be um, stage one chronic kidney disease, or the first stage, very first stage. Um, as kidney function declines, um, so does the GFR. Um, and the stages, uh, stage of chronic kidney disease slowly um, increases from stage one to stage two to stage three all the way up to stage five, which is the um, last and final stage of kidney disease. And at this point, um, your kidneys are not, are, you're, you're considered to be in kidney failure, and you will need to um, be on dialysis or receive a kidney transplantation to stay alive at this point. Yes? Are there any symptoms that occur in any of these stages? In some of the earlier stages, no. There may not be any symptoms at all. Um, and this is, 
I will read the question again so our online audience can hear. So the question was, is there any um, symptoms that with chronic kidney disease? And the earlier stages, there, um, there, there usually isn't any symptoms. Um, it usually start noticing, um, you usually start noticing the symptoms um, in the later stages, stage four or five, when um, your kidneys are, in, um, are, in, are mostly in, um, you, when you're in mostly in kidney failure. Yes? What is this protein called? Does it have a name? Um, it's called albumin, so it's just a normal protein in your body. Okay. Um, so what causes chronic kidney disease and who is at risk? Um, so the biggest causes of chronic kidneys, chronic kidney disease are the two on top, um, diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, when these two conditions are not well controlled, um, they damage those small blood vessels um, within the kidneys. And this can eventually lead to um, kidney disease requiring dialysis. Um, then there are some other um, conditions that, um, based on family history, that puts certain people at risk. Um, but being a pharmacist, my focus is really on the bottom one on the list, um, drugs and toxins. Um, Over-the-counter pain medicines are um, probably one of the biggest culprits in this category. Um, now before, yes? I noticed you have the aspirin on there, but my doctor always recommends that I take a baby aspirin every day. Yes, so I was going to get that to the, um, we haven't gotten there yet, but yes, I'll, I'll make sure to cover that. Um, so now before I move on, I guess I'd like to stop and just really take a quick poll. Um, I have up on the screen four types of over-the-counter um, general over-the-counter pain medicines that are available here in the U.S. There's ibuprofen, which goes by um, brand name Motrin or Advil. There's naproxen, which is known by brand name Aleve. Um, then you have um, your classic aspirin, um, as well as acetaminophen, which is brand name Tylenol. Um, now, by a show of hands, how many, have you, how many of you have at least one of these products sitting in your medicine um, cabinet at home right now? So, well, almost all of you. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, how many of you have used at least one of these products on a regular basis um, for pain? And for a regular basis, I mean long, longer than like a, a week or so. Yeah. Okay, so quite a few of you as well. Um, okay, so so those of you who take it on a chronic basis, I can maybe assume that you guys are experts on the, the medication that you're taking and you know all the potential side effects of each of these medications. So um, those of you who raise your hand, can you um, maybe tell me which of these four affects the health of your kidneys? Yes? Yes? Not necessarily. Not, not, uh, not Yep, yeah, so um, these three affect the health of your kidney. So ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin. Um, and these, are the, um, these medications are in a class of pain medications known as NSAIDs. Um, acetaminophen is not an NSAID, so it does not, it has a separate way of working, so it does not necessarily affect your kidneys. Yes? Doesn't it affect the liver, though? Mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah, so the question was, doesn't it affect the liver? And yes, it does affect the liver. Um, I'll, I'll go into more of these details later, but I just wanted to get, um, just do a quick poll here. Um, so um, I guess I'll just start with um, just um, what are NSAIDs. Um, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, it is a class of pain medicine that not only relieves pain and reduces fever, but they also reduce swelling and inflammation. So they work really well for muscle aches, but um, NSAIDs, as some of um, that NSAIDs as we know now, um, carry many risks. Um, and um, the way that, um, and one of the biggest risks is, um, as we now know, is harm to the kidneys. And they really do this by reducing the um, amount of blood that actually flows um, to the kidneys. Um, remember those little tiny blood vessels that connect to the nephrons, um, to the chimerias? Um, NSAIDs actually constrict those blood vessels in the kidneys. And so it does not allow the blood flow um, um, to, um, it does not allow enough blood to flow to the kidneys, and if you do, and if you have, if you have this happen for on a chronic basis, then you'll eventually slowly lose the function of the kidneys, and um, chronic kidney disease will develop. Um, 
And um, there's, I think, a statistic put out by the National Kidney Foundation that um, that about 5% of new cases of um, chronic kidney disease were actually caused by um, these NSAID medications. So they, they're, there indeed is a risk, a real risk, with um, taking these medications on a chronic, base, um, chronic basis. Um, and with NSAIDs, um, kidney disease is not the only potential um, serious effect. There are other um, side effects associated with this medication. And, um, and, so, um, and so this includes stomach bleeding. Um, increased blood pressure, um, as well as increased risk for heart attack and stroke. Um, and I put this in, um, in, in uh, parentheses with exception of aspirin. So um, those of you who take aspirin, um, the baby dose aspirin, um, even though aspirin is considered to be an NSAID, um, small doses of aspirin actually um, is actually okay, safe to take. Um, when I um, Aspirin has some properties that um, acts as a, makes it act as a blood thinner, so it actually ha um, um, prevents um, future um, heart attacks and strokes from occurring. Um, when you take it a small dose um, uh, on a daily basis, say eight, uh, baby aspirin, 81 milligrams per day, um, it um, it you still you have that blood thinning effect, but you don't have the um, you don't have it's not enough to get the analgesic effect. Of, or the, the pain relieving effect of um, the aspirin. Um, so um, when you so when you when I'm talking about taking uh, medications on a chronic basis, um, when it when it comes to aspirin, you want um, it's the regular strength aspirin that we're more concerned about. Um, now, um, quickly, just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever taken the time to actually read the label um, in detail of an over-the-counter pain medicine? You mean the whole label? <laughs> I mean the whole label, because there's uh, some really in, um, um, important information really buried in here. So I know I, when I usually read it, I usually just go straight to the directions and don't pay attention to any of it. But um, if you're taking any over-the-counter pain medication, you really want to make sure that you um, that you you're reading the, um, all of this, especially for um, some some of these medications like NSAIDs, which have some really serious um, side effects. And we can actually see—I don't know if we can actually read on them there, but um, there is information about um, people with kidney disease should not be taking it, um, and some of the serious of, um, adverse effects. It's really hard to see it. It's tiny print, um, and it's not wanting to read it because of because it's just not very um, reader friendly is um, perfectly normal. Um, yes. Excuse me. I never read those things because it seems like they're putting every possibility in there just to cover their butts. And it's not really important information. Um, so with these with these labels, it's I would I would reconsider reading um, the whole entire label. Um, <laughs> Um, just because, um, and if you see on the commercials, yes, in the commercials they tend to um, list all of the potential um, side effects with the medication, um, and any something small like nausea and vomiting. You won't, you have that on here. Um, you have um, rashes on here, but it also lists the more important ones, more some of the more serious ones, and it really breaks it down for you. And ask the doctor before you um, you using this medication. Um, stop use and um, seek the advice of a um, doctor if, and it really lists it out for you. Um, and if you miss some of these things, you may list you may miss some really um, important information on here. Yes. Can occasional use of these assets uh, cause a problem? If you, if you have a backache and you take it once a week or something, is is that harmful or? So the question was, can occasional um, NSAID use be okay? Um, so um, depending on, um, it, there's no universal answer because everybody is different. Everybody has are, is taking different medications. Um, everybody has different um, health problems. Um, so there really isn't a universal um, right or wrong. If it's one dose, um, just for a one-time thing, I would be okay with that, but if you're taking it for um, over like a period of several days, 
then I would I would be um, a little bit more cautious until um, I talk to a um, pharmacist or a, um, your physician um, who can really review your um, medical history, um, review the medications you're taking, make sure that there isn't any um, potential conflicts with what you're taking. Um, so we just saw that package insert and it's just too convoluted. So I thought I might um, make it easier for you to understand and compare some of the different um, pain medications if I put them all in a table um, format for you like this. Um, so we have our three NSAIDs. We have ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin. And then we also have acetaminophen. Um, acetaminophen, um, as we know, is not an NSAID. Um, but um, it does still carry um, a risk um, for liver damage, as we see from the bottom here. Um, and this um, liver damage is actually entirely dose-dependent, um, meaning your risk increases um, drastically if you take more than the maximum recommended dose of 4,000 milligrams per day. Um, now, one of the major problems with acetaminophen, though, is that it is found in so many different products, whether over-the-counter or prescription pain medications. It's in a lot of different products. Um, and so um, unless if you're reading, if you know exactly what you're taking and how much you're taking of that product, um, it's really easy to um, exceed that 4,000 milligram um, per day um, maximum recommended amount and um, potentially have some, do some serious harm to your liver. Um, now if you compare the NSAIDs, you'll notice that um, they all look fairly similar. They're all, um, they're all good for muscle aches. Um, they all treat your fever, um, and they all reduce inflammation. Um, and so remember, um, with the NSAIDs, they're an anti-inflammatory. Um, acetaminophen does not have that anti-inflammatory effect, so it won't be as effective for um, some types of pain like muscle aches. Um, but with NSAIDs, um, you, um, again, you don't, um, you don't want to exceed taking them for more than 10 days for pain for any of the medications. If you take them longer than this, um, it really does increase your risk for um, developing some serious um, side effects. Um, um, now you'll notice um, one major difference with the aspirin um, is that it does not um, um, fat and, and that it does um, that does not have some of the toxicities associated with some of the, uh, the ibuprofen and um, naproxen. So it does not, um, does not um, cause a heart attack and stroke. And I'm, like I mentioned this earlier, um, baby doses of aspirin are okay. Um, and this is due to the um, anti, um, its ability to uh, produce some, um, some blood thinning effects with the aspirin. Um, but with regular doses of aspirin that's used for pain, the 325 milligram tablets, um, you have to take that every four hours to get any sort of pain relief. With baby aspirin, you're only taking it to um, get the blood thinning effects, and you only need a very small amount for that. Um, and with that small amount, it's not enough to cause any sort of um, significant kidney damage. Um, and so with the aspirin that's listed up on here, this is just the pain relieving, um, pain relieving amount. So if you're taking 325 or 650 milligrams of um, aspirin, one to two, one to two tablets um, every four hours, that's how much you need to um, get some of the pain relieving effects. And when you do this on a chronic basis, this is what will eventually lead to some of the um, kidney damage and the, uh, the risks that we see with the NSAIDs. Yes. Is there a benefit to taking these medications with a meal or with a large amount of water, for example? So the question was, is there any benefit to taking these medications with a meal or large amounts of water? Um, if any of you have taken an, um, an NSAID before, such as ibuprofen, you may have noticed that it tells you to take it with food. And the primary reason for this is because NSAIDs cause a lot of um, stomach irritation, with um, potentially um, can cause stomach ulcers or stomach bleeding. And when you take it with food, it actually reduces this risk. And so that's the primary reason um, that they tell you to take it with food. But it doesn't uh, do anything as far as the kidney is concerned. No, it does not have any impact on the kidneys. 
Um, now, between ibuprofen and naproxen, these two are um, very similar. Uh, the only um, difference, actually, between them is the dose. Um, with ibuprofen, um, it only you take it more frequently, with four, every four to six hours. Um, but with Aleve, you can take it um, every less frequently, every eight to twelve hours. And some people get some um, more benefits with one over the other. Um, so it's all it will really all comes down to which when um, you really get most the most benefit from. Um, so it's more of a personal preference. Okay, so um, now what if you can't get enough relief with some of these over-the-counter pain medications or do you have a condition that really prevents you from um, taking them? What else can you take um, for pain? Um, for mild pain, I, um, I recommend I'd recommend patients um, use some topical pain relievers that, um, and some of these can actually be very effective. Um, hot or cold packs, um, or sometimes a combination of the two, um, can really provide relief um, for anyone with any type of sore muscles or um, joints. Um, heat actually relaxes your muscles um, and dilates blood vessels um, and allows more oxygen be, to be sent to the, um, to the sore area. Um, it also decreases a sensation of pain, um, so it's a it's a good um, it's a good thing to it's a, it's a good alternative therapy to use for um, any sort of um, inflammation um, that you may have um, experienced. Um, cold, on the other hand, um, numb sores some numb sore areas and reduces inflammation by constricting blood flow, and it can be particularly helpful for um, pain and swelling due to arthritis or a sprained um, ankle, for example. Um, one of the nice things about these two uh, therapies is that um, you can really use things you find around the house, um, such as a heating pad or a washcloth that has been soaked in water can be a good source um, to, for, um, uh, for heating therapy. Um, or for if you need to reduce some inflammation using um, cold therapy, um, a good old classic um, bag of frozen peas is a, a good approach, or filling a bag, a Ziploc bag with um, ice and water um, can provide the needed relief for pain and swelling. Um, for joint pain, um, topical aspirin may also provide some pain relief. Um, since it's topical and you're applying it to the area of, um, of pain, it'll actually work quicker. And since it's topical, you're not taking it by mouth. You're not going to get any. You're not going to get the systemic um, effects or the negative side effects um, that you see if you take um, aspirin by mouth. Um, and a lot of people say that it works a lot quicker since you're applying it directly to the site of pain. Um, and some things you can um, and some products that you can find are listed up up here. Um, when you're looking for um, an aspirin product, um, it won't actually list aspirin on the. Um, label will most likely um, say salicylate as the active ingredient. So this is the same as aspirin. And so um, that'll, that'll be a way for you to determine whether um, the product that you're taking um, contains aspirin or not. Um, camphor and menthol, um, as well as capsaicin, are interesting compounds in terms of the way they work. Um, these compounds are actually called counter irritants um, because they create either a cooling or a um, warming effect. Um, and they work by distracting the mind with um, the pain. So it's kind of like if you um, punch yourself after you hit yourself with a hammer. It's kind of this, the same effect. So you're masking one pain with another type of pain. Um, camphor and menthol have this cooling effect. Uh, if any of you um, have like tried medicated lip balms, for example, that have menthol, it's um, it has that menthol in it to provide that cooling effect. So if your lips are chapped, it kind of helps um, some cover up or mask some of the um, pain that you have from chapped lips. Um, capsaicin um, has um, a burning sensation to it, a warming sensation. Um, and capsaicin is actually what gives hot chili peppers its heat. Um, and so, um, and so um, it's, an, it's actually an effective um, product to use for um, um, neuralgia, so it's a specific type of pain, um, nerve pain, um, and you just put it on the side of um, side of pain, and it actually takes a while for it to work um, over a couple of period of a uh, few days um, until you start um, experience any sort of pain relief. Um, but um, 
I've had patients who say this um, product actually works really well for um, the nerve pain that they have. Yes? I saw on TV that they were advertising a patch of an Aleve patch. Is, and, is, is a patch that says Aleve on it giving you the same NASAD as Gmail's patch? Oh, it's an Aleve patch. I would check the ingredients on it. So if, yeah, I have. I've just seen it advertised. You know, now you don't have to take the, right. to take the patch on it. I'm just curious. Right. I'm not familiar with that product, um, but there are a lot of brand name products that actually have different products that they sell with different ingredients. So just because it says Aleve does not necessarily mean that it's got the same NSAID on there. It could be just a t um, another type of um, product that's marketed under the brand name Aleve. All right. Um, so now for some just broad general considerations with over-the-counter pain medicine, um, there's some things you just want to um, really consider. Um, you should avoid NSAIDs if you have kidney disease, um, are over the age of 60, or take blood pressure medications. Um, now, if you don't know if you have kidney disease, a um, good way to check is through the two tests that I mentioned, um, with the urine test and the blood test. Um, if you're older in age, you want to be particularly cautious um, with NSAIDs, since they do um, increase your risk for um, experiencing some of the toxicities associated, so with the um, kidney um, kidney disease or the, the, the stomach problems, the stomach bleeding, um, heart attack and stroke. There are um, numerous studies that have shown that the older population are at a, a much higher risk um, for um, experiencing this. And this is why oftentimes that um, acetaminophen is the preferred agent um, or recommended by um, most physicians for the elderly population. Um, you should also avoid drinking alcohol while taking any pain medicine. Now, occasional alcohol use is okay if you have like one drink, but if, you, if you're a regular drinker um, and you're taking any sort of NSAIDs, it really does increase your risk for um, some of the toxicities, particularly with the, the stomach problems, with the stomach bleeding um, and the ulcers. Um, and if you take it with acetaminophen, we know acetaminophen um, affects the liver um, and the alcohol is metabolized for the liver, so it's almost like a double whammy um, and almost it, increased, it almost increases your risk for um, liver damage in that scenario. Um, now here's a, um, a really good tip that I learned. Um, if you want to continue taking NSAIDs or used NSAIDs um, while minimizing the risks, <gasps> Um, you should try alternating doses of NSAID and acetaminophen. Um, and so this will allow you to get some of the um, effects of NSAID, the anti-inflammatory effects of NSAIDs, um, without, um, um, while reducing or minimizing some of the toxicity. So it will keep you covered for in terms of pain, but you'll get coverage for both types of um, pain um, on a consistent basis. Yes? Do you mean like alternate within a day or? One day you take leave, and the next day you take. Um, it's per dose. So if you uh, if you take um, a one dose, as you take Advil, and then the next dose you take um, a, um, Tylenol. So it's within a day. Um, so if you if you're taking um, Advil every six hours, then you the first um, when you first take it, if you first take Advil, then six hours later you'll take Tylenol. And then the one, the next dose after that will be Advil again. So you you alternate back and forth. Um, now, as always, you want to, um, whenever taking any sort of these um, these pain medications, you always want to make sure you take the smallest effective dose for the shortest amount of time, and that you do not take um, NSAIDs for more than ten days for pain. Um, if you you also want to make sure that you read the labels carefully. Um, you want to make sure that the products that you take, um, you're familiar with what products you're taking. So um, we mentioned the Aleve patch. Um, just because it says Aleve on it does not mean, mean it contains naproxen. Um, and so you want to make sure exactly what, what it is in the product. Um, if you're taking, um, a lot of products contain um, the acetaminophen, the Tylenol. 
And so you want to make sure if you're taking multiple products, you know exactly what it is you're taking. And then, of course, you want to always talk to your health care provider, um, especially if you're taking other medications or if you have other um, health conditions that can really, um, really affect the, 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 um, the outcome of the, med the medications that you're taking. So any questions regarding the medications before I move on? Yes. Is there any separate recommendation for someone who only has one kidney? Um, so if you only have one kidney, I would, I would, um, you really want to do anything you can to really protect it. Um, and um, I, I would avoid anything that would put you in harm's way. And so that would be um, avoid all types of NSAIDs. So if you need to take any type of pain medication, um, it would be um, Tylenol or the acetaminophen. Is there a question in the back? No? Right. Um, now, before I wrap up, I'd like to, um, I guess, put in a brief comments about safe medication and disposal. Um, now, why is this important and why should I care? Well, there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, first of all, in recent years, you may have noticed that there are a lot of headlines um, covering and reporting on the national opioid epidemic. Um, this epidemic is undoubtedly real. Um, drug of overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death among adults in the U.S., um, and it now surpasses the number of traffic or of deaths caused by car accidents. Um, and you can see from this um, chart here that since 2002, the number of deaths caused by um, drug overdose um, has increased year after year. Um, up in, uh, up until 2015, where we have the last estimates available, um, over 50,000 deaths attributed to um, drug overdose. Um, here in Wisconsin, um, to help combat this issue, um, the governor actually passed a legislation that became effective just last month um, that now allows pharmacists to um, dispense naloxone, which reverses the um, effects of opioids, um, for them to dispense it without a prescription. Um, so um, it will help ease the burden a little bit and make um, emergency um, medicine more accessible to the community. Uh, we have a question from yes. online that says, is baby aspirin okay as a legumen? I don't know what legumen is. Regimen? Regimen, probably right. <laughs> I have one kidney as well and I take it every day. So the question was, um, if I have one kidney, um, is it okay to take um, a baby aspirin um, once a day? Um, and at the at this dose of for the um, for the baby aspirin, it's a small amount of dose, and it's not enough to have that powerful pain relief effect um, and have that um, have those side effects that we're really concerned about with the. Um, with the NSAIDs, so um, it's okay to continue taking it. Um, it's important to have um, a blood thinning effect um, to prevent um, heart attacks and strokes, so um, it's, it's, it's a safe um, regimen to continue. Um, now, do any of you have any um, children or grandchildren um, living with you at home or visiting you? Yeah. Um, now you might find this uh, statistic um, kind of alarming. Um, in 2013, 15 percent of Wisconsin high school students reported using a prescription drug without a prescription. Um, I'll just say this, if any of you have any sort of prescription pain medications at home, make sure you lock it up. Um, um, if you leave your prescriptions just lying around um, in an easily accessible um, location, if you have any sort of um, visitors or if you have children um, around, um, it can really provide a um, um, teen or anybody of, um, interested um, with an open invitation to really, um, to really experience, experiment with um, the medication. So um, make sure you keep it out of sight, lock it up um, if you can. We have another question 
online seems a little off topic, but could you please comment on uh, prednisone for anti-rejection and long-term use at five milligrams a day? So the question was, um, can I comment on the use of prednisone, what was the dose, five milligrams? for um, anti-rejection a day. Um, so prednisone is, um, is, an, um, is a glucocorticoid, so it's, a, it's not an NSAID. Um, it's not, um, it, it does not have any sort of um, effects on the kidneys. Um, so in terms of its safety profile, it's, um, it's, a, it's a medication that um, should be okay to um, continue. All right. Yes. Oh, I was pointing to her. Oh, okay. <laughs> these um, over-the-counter medications. You know, I, I I heard what you said. You know, previously, and I, I guess periodically I have had situations in my life. I broke my leg uh, a number of years ago in three places. It was a painful accident, and I was. They gave me vitamin, oxycontin, that sort of stuff. What is the effect, if any, with that kind of, I mean, those are controlled substances. Right. So, um, Vicodin and Oxycontin, they, they, um, they usually have um, a powerful opioid um, pain reliever in, in it. Um, but they also have Tylenol um, as a combination combined with it. So, Vicodin is a combination of Tylenol. On hydrocodone, um, so the, the the Tylenol that's within the Vicodin um, is what we're talk, talking about here, um, and so a lot of people don't realize that um, what they're taking with the Vicodin actually contains Tylenol, um, and this is where it can really get easily um, uh, easy to add up the doses of what you're taking if you don't realize what you're um, taking. So the the opioid within is um, they add the Tylenol within the with the opioid with the hydrocodone to actually reduce the amount that is needed for the hydrocodone. So you don't need to take as much, um, and it's supposed to kind of minimize the risks of both drugs. Um, so you don't have to take as much, um, and so it's supposed to minimize the the, the risks associated with it. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Interestingly enough, I had to take some <coughs> hydrocodone slash acetaminophen product when I had um, a back injury. And um, I got to the point where I called the pain medication gal and said, you know, this just isn't working. And I don't want to go to the next tired thing. And she said, don't worry about it. Take two a week with it and we'll work fine. And she was right. Okay. I, I would not advocate that, but... <laughs> um, when you combine when you combine multiple drugs together, um, especially two NSAIDs together, that really will um, increase your risk for um, for doing some harm. Um, hopefully, you didn't do that long term. Long time, okay. Yes. I've recently seen on TV that uh, other drugs can damage your kidneys as well. Proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, Asaflex, and others. Is that true, and how, how damaging are they? Um, so yeah, so there was actually a study that was released a, f a couple years ago that um, that related um, that found that there's an association um, with people who use proton pump inhibitors like Nexium, or um, um, that cause um, an increased risk for chronic kidney disease. Um, if you're taking it. Um, are you taking it on a chronic, on a regular basis, on a daily basis? She um, is. So um, I would talk to your doctor to see if it's something that she needs to continue on and what its real purpose is. Um, I cannot comment exactly um, based on um, whether she needs to continue on it or not. But if she is, if it's something that can she can go without, um, I would. I would talk to your doctor about and potentially if she can get off of it. Regular monitoring of the blood blood testing would that help? 
Um, you mean for, to check for the kidney? Um, to see the how the kidneys are functioning and, and that they're not being damaged. Um, that's potentially something you can you can ask for the doctor um, if it's covered with your um, by your insurance um, to have that um, testing done. Um, but I would first just t talk to your doctor to make sure that um, she it is something that she needs to take. A lot of times, some sometimes I think proton pump inhibitors um, are probably one of the most overprescribed medications, um, and um, a lot of people are unnecessarily on it. Yes, question. Um, protein and a good protein in your blood, and that will lead to kidneys damage. Um, so, so protein, yeah. So normally you have protein in your blood. Um, if protein, um, if, if protein is found in your urine, then that could be a sign of kidney damage. Yes. So, um, if your doctor says that you're supposed to drink a protein drink a day, mm -hmm. you know, like Insure or one of those guys, um, does that protein go into the blood? Um, yes, it does make it into the blood, but it doesn't mean if it's in your blood. It doesn't mean it's. Um, it doesn't mean that you have uh, kidney disease. Um, it's only kidney disease if um, if it if it passes into the urine. Um, and there are other there. Are, and this is this is just a general rule. Um, it does not. There are other conditions that will cause you to have protein in your blood, um, in your urine. Um, but if if it's if a high amount is found in your urine, then that could be, that, that that could be a, um, a sign. And of course, um, if that is um, if you do find urine um, or blood protein in your urine, um, you would also want to follow that up with a um, a blood test to make sure um, that your to to make sure to see how your kidneys are functioning. Yes. And what would you do if you did have this? What what was the with the with the kidney disease, yeah, so with the stage one. So what do you do with kidney disease? So um, I put up on the list earlier what the the major causes of kidney disease were. Um, you really can't do anything to um, to treat it except for treating the underlying condition. So uh, if you um, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, then you know um, then you want to make sure that that's controlled, and that's the only. Way um, way you can prevent the kidney disease from progressing further to stage two to stage three. Um, so you can prevent it from progressing forward, but you cannot go backwards. Um, and the best way to do that is to identify what's causing that kidney disease and to um, take care of that underlying cause. Question? Uh, yes. Now, are there certain blood pressure medications that are better for for keeping your kidneys healthy than other ones? Very good question, yes. <laughs> um, so um, the medication that most doctors are um, prescribed to keep their kidneys healthy is a class of medications called ACE inhibitors. Um, oh, ACE inhibitors. So if you're taking a medication that ends with Pril, then you know you're taking an ACE inhibitor. And these medications actually protect your kidneys. Would that be like lysinopril? Like, like lysinopril. Yep. So that's probably one of the most common ones. Yes. Um, is there a correlation between some of the anti-rejection drugs, specifically Prograp or TAC, that cause kidney problems? Um, there, there is. Um, it's something I'm not well first on myself, so it's something that I'd have to um, dig a little bit deeper into and um, get back to you on that. I know in transplant they try and get you a prograph levels as low as they possibly can because the right. disease has been occurring. So right. I know if you know study or you know, whatever. Yes, question. Um, they say there's a, a kidneys, one type of kidney stones Call, is that calcium? Is it okay to take calcium over the counter? To, if it, is it okay to take calcium over the counter? Um, so, it, again, it really depends if it's something that was that your physician told you to take particularly. Um, if it's something that um, if it's a 
if you had blood work done that found that you were low in calcium and it's something that you needed, um, then um, then depending on your um, particular case, then it might be okay for you to take. Um, does that answer your question? All right. So, um, in other words, no one's ever told me not to take it. All of that you say, take it. I have osteoporosis. And so, um, I don't know if the osteoporosis medicine, you know, he, he said to take calcium. To take calcium. Um, so, Okay, um, so um, with osteoporosis, if you're, if you're told to take calcium, um, it's, it's, it's not going to do anything in terms of your kidneys, um, your kidney functioning. Um, it may, um, if you're taking, um, remember, you need vitamin D to absorb calcium. Um, if you're taking a lot of this calcium in, it could, if you're taking too much in, it could potentially lead to um, kidney stones from forming, um, and that's one way you could potentially lead to kidney damage, um, but that's only um, if you're taking, um, if you have um, high amounts already. But um, again, it's something, it's a discussion they need to have with your physician because they can, they need to check um, to make sure that you have a right calcium amount in your blood, um, in your body. Yes? You, you, you do know about um, the over-the-counter stuff, but prescription stuff, the doctor's supposed to know? Um, so, so you, I mean, I mean, I know it, but it's those. It's something that needs to. Um, I don't know all of your health history. I don't know. I don't have all of your health information. So it's something that, um, unless I have that um, access to, it's I cannot make a, um, a particular um, statement on um, what to do, what not to do, until I have that information available. But you should let your doctor know everything. That you're taking. Yes. So you, you need to talk to your doctor and make sure if you're taking any over-the-counter medicines, what you're taking exactly, um, when you're taking, um, how much you're taking. Yes. What about uh, if your urine has bubbles in it sometimes? Um, th that's normal. That's okay. Um, Is that liver or kidney? Um, th um, that's, um, it's, it's, I don't, I'm not familiar with it, but I, I'm pretty sure it's. Not, um, I think I remember um, that it's not should not be a concern. Um, it's a normal, normal circumstance. Yes. Is it helpful to drink a lot of water? You say like eight glasses of water a day or something. Is, does that help the kidneys? Oh yes. So the question is, um, does drinking a lot of water, like eight cups of water? eight glasses of water a day, is, is that, will that help the kidneys? Um, so I tell peop, uh, my patients to drink as much water as um, they, um, they, they want, that they, they, they're thirsty for. Um, you cannot make an overall broad statement saying that somebody who's 200 pounds, 300 pounds, needs the same amount of water as somebody who's um, 100 pounds. Um, so you, you drink as much water, um, until you're not thirsty anymore. That's how. That's the rule of thumb that I um, go by. Yes. Question. Hi. With regard to the five stages of kidney disease that are tied to different levels of your GFR, mm -hmm. has that table with those values been present for a very long time, or is that something where they relatively, you know, change that? And sort of a related question is when you have the testing done and they calculate the GFR, typically, at least my experience has been, is they, they don't calculate anything over or don't present you with the results of anything over 60. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about those two things. Sure. So the question was um, regarding with the stages of um, chronic kidney disease and the GFR. Um, and um, how they report it um, only values that are less than 60. Um, so with this first couple of stages with G um, so I'll answer your first question with how, if it's the staging system has been around a long time. Yes, it has been around a long time for um, uh, numerous decades. Um, and um, they, the only real concern with the um, kidney disease is actually when it really progresses to 
um, to stage three and beyond. Um, first, um, a lot of older, um, so naturally your kidney function declines as we age. Um, there's a rule of thumb that starting from the age of 30, you lose 10% of your kidney function. Um, for every decade you get older. So um, if you have a normal GFR that's, um, that's about 100, 110, um, by the time you're 60, 70 um, years of age, um, it's perfectly normal to have a GFR that's 70 or 75. Um, it does not mean you have any sort of kidney disease. Um, you will have, it's considered kidney disease if you have both a GFR of, um, of 75 as well as protein damage um, or damage to the kidneys, which in this case is determined by if you have any protein in your urine. And for that reason, they don't report it unless if you have um, a GFR less than 60. Um, and um, a lot of times, a lot of med medications that um, people are prescribed, um, they're not really affected um, by whether, or in terms of like the dose um, or how much you need to take, they're not affected um, if the GFR is over 60. But if it gets uh, below 60, then that's when you need to start thinking about maybe changing how much um, of the medications you give or what dose you give to the patients. Yes. I can just add to that. So the staging of chronic kidney disease, um, I don't want to say is a relative new phenomenon, but the five stages. So it used to be um, uh, kind of called end stage, you know, kidney disease or ESRD, and it was just a, a common way for people. It, it didn't, it wasn't um, <laughs> outlined like it is now in terms of the general public. So I would say that that staging in the five stages with those particular numbers, okay. um, I want to say it's a relatively new phenomenon. There was always yeah. stages of kidney disease, but it was articulated probably in the clinical world as more of a common practice for all of us to understand. Yeah. But in the interest of time, would you like to Yes. Um, I only have a couple, or one slide here left. Um, now, I know I just talked about the opioid epidemic um, and that being a reason to dispose of your medication safely. Um, now, if, does, if that doesn't really touch home to, um, touch home for you or um, doesn't quite hit close home for you, um, maybe this will. Um, in 2008, the Associated Press published a report that found that approximately or that, that found at least 46 million American, um, Americans are supplied with water that has tested positive for trace amounts of pharmaceuticals. And these include antibiotics, anti-seizure medications, cholesterol medications, NSAIDs, um, and even um, female sex hormones. Um, and these drugs end up in the waterways um, after being excreted from the body or from folks just dumping it and um, flushing it down the toilet. Um, now what is really interesting here is that over the past decade, um, scientists from the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the U.S. Geological Survey have um, found um, male fish that actually show um, female traits that are able to actually grow eggs. And these fish have been dubbed intersex fish um, because they have both male and female parts. Um, and this has been attributed to um, pollutants in the water. Um, including estrogen, um, which is a female hormone found in a lot of um, prescription drugs. Um, now, there isn't any evidence that our contaminated waters have um, any ill effects on people, but if it's enough that it can um, really turn male fish into female fish, it really gets you to think about um, the potential long-term effects it could have on um, the human population. Um, now, the good news um, here is that in Milwaukee, the only drug that our water tested positive for was nicotine, so beyond a lot of cigarette butts floating in our water, um, our water appears to be relatively clean, um, at least in terms of pharmaceuticals. Um, now, if you want to check out what drugs were found in the water in other U.S. cities, especially for um, our folks listening on online, um, this um, link down here at the bottom, I recommend you just checking out the side. You can um, it has this interactive map that will show you um, all the different U.S. cities and what they tested positive for, and it's got some um, really cool videos on there as well. Um, so what exactly can you do to help solve the problem with the opioid epidemic and polluted waters? Well, if you take any pre uh, prescription medications, you can store your prescription medications in a secure uh, place, such as a safer locked cabinet. Um, if you have any visitors, 
um, coming to your home, make sure um, you lock them up um, when they're there. Um, to never flush or drain any medication um, down the toilet um, for the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, and how can you dispose of your medications properly? Well, there are a few ways. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Justice um, offers a, um, a drug take back day event um, at least on a twice a yearly basis, once in the spring and once in the fall. Um, the next drug take back day is Saturday, April 29th. Um, and if you um, go down to this website here, Dose of Reality, um, Wisconsin.gov, it'll um, have this map here where you can find your locus, uh, your closest um, location to drop off medications. Um, you can also drop them off at your local police department or you can call your pharmacy um, and let them know and they'll um, let you know if you can um, drop them off at their location. Um, for those of you who are listening online who are um, outside of Wisconsin, um, there's this US, um, this DEA website, DEA Diversion um, website, they'll um, have national locations available and so you can type in your zip code and it'll um, find the nearest location where you can drop off your medications and this includes both um, controlled um, opioid medications as well as um, your normal prescription and over-the-counter medications. Yes? Will they only take it in the bottle? They'll take anything. Well, it, well, that's why you need to call them in advance. Some places um, they'll, they'll take only certain types, um, but you can find um, a location that will, yeah, they'll eventually find, yeah, they'll take it. Yes? Uh, in this area, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District also does um, drug disposal or medication disposal in a lot of different counties around here a couple times a year. I think that the drug take back is probably trying to get drugs off the street, and the sewage district is trying to get medications out of the sewer, or out of the water, because it ends up in the fishery. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, it doesn't Metropolitan Milwaukee Sewage District. All right. Then um, if you need any more information, um, there's some these brochures up here on the table up front. Um, for those of you who are listening online, um, the PDFs of these brochures are available online. I've posted the links for them um, here. Um, and you can always contact the National Kidney Foundation um, at the number or just um, email them or give them a call. So um, that's all I have for you tonight. Great. Thank you. Thanks to the people uh, listening on, uh, and watching online. For those of you um, both uh, online as uh, those of you here, we'll post um, Catherine's PowerPoint on our website and there will also be a recording um, of Catherine tonight along with the PowerPoint. So again, if you had friends or um, other folks that wanted to come tonight or might be interested, we'll have that available on our um, website. For those of you in the room, you have to do your homework before you're allowed to leave. And that means circling very carefully, coloring in that circle on the evaluation, because I don't want to get yelled at by the creative <laughs> folks that are so kind to let us use that. But thank you, Catherine, again thank for uh, kicking off um, Kidney Month. I think she did a great, great job. Thank you to the folks listening online. I, that'll um, end our program tonight, but thank you um, all for coming. Thank you. After about a half an hour, we drop us to 12 and continue until the questions start. Do you need to No, I have to do this other thing though because Cindy made me work for the last four days straight to finish this thing. <laughs> well, there's an awful lot of people who want you to be a medical.